this podcast discusses true crime, which may entail violence and other material intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Kayla, and I'm one of the hosts for a podcast called A Little Wicked, and this is our YouTube channel. So, A Little Wicked discusses true crime, cults, conspiracies, and everything in between. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere that you find podcasts. We're also on Patreon, where you get bonus episodes once a month and ad-free episodes every week. And on our YouTube channel, I'm trying to discuss more things that we don't discuss on our on our podcast, so you get a little bit of more bonus material here as well. So... Hope you enjoy. All right, so for today's episode, we are discussing Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. Nathan Leopold was born November 19th, 1904, and Richard Loeb was born June 11th, 1905. Both were raised in the affluent area of Kenwood on the south side of Chicago, Illinois. The boys had grown up about two blocks from each other, but they only met in the summer of 1920, where it is rumored that not only were they friends, but they were lovers as well. Leopold was an extremely smart student who was enrolled at the University of Chicago at 15 years old and was an amateur ornithologist, so he studied birds, um, who had published two papers in the AUK, which was the leading ornithological journal in the United States. I ate that word. Leopold's family was very wealthy and well-connected as his father was a businessman who inherited a shipping company and made a fortune in aluminum can and paper box manufacturing. In 1924, when he was 19, Leopold was studying law at the University of Chicago. Richard Loeb, 18, also came from a wealthy family. His father, the vice president of Sears, Roebuck & Company, had an estimated $10 million. He was the third out of four boys in his family and graduated from University High School at 14 years old and then enrolled at the University of Chicago where he was not thriving as a student. He was earning mediocre grades and spending more time playing cards than sitting in class. At the end of his sophomore year, he transferred to the University of Michigan, where he was still a non-impressive student and eventually became an alcoholic while he was in school. Somehow, he still managed to graduate, and in 1924, he was back in Chicago taking graduate courses in history at the university. This is when the boys had reconnected after being at college apart for those few years, and the two had very little in common but still hung out together. The only thing they really had in common was their interest in crime, with Loeb causing trouble and Leopold not far behind him, basically just cheering him on and supporting him as he set fires, stole cars, and destroyed storefront windows. They were both also obsessed with the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche and his ideology of a superman, and it was interpreted by these two as someone who is morally above the law and can do no wrong as he is superior to those around him. They believed that they were both this type of man. On November 10th, 1923, the two boys drove from Chicago to the University of Michigan, which is roughly a six-hour drive, in order to rob Loeb's former frat house, Zeta Beta Tau. While there, they managed to steal only about 80 bucks, a few watches, some pen knives, and a typewriter. The boys weren't happy with what little they were able to steal for the drive that it took to get out there and had argued on the way home since Leopold was more angry that he felt that their friendship slash relationship was more one-sided since he was always going along with Loeb's ideas and did whatever he wanted. But Loeb seemed to keep up a wall and keep Leopold at arm's length. Loeb was able to calm Leopold down and reassured him of his loyalty and affection towards him. He then went on to talk about how he was upset that none of their previous crimes had ever made it to the papers as the boys had wanted recognition for their work. Loeb had then come up with a perfect crime, which would be to kidnap a child for ransom. Leopold agreed with this and also thought it was the best idea that either of them had ever had. These two had spent the next seven months planning out what their plan would be when the time came to kidnap a child and had agreed that they would ask for a $10,000 ransom from the child's family. Their plan was to kidnap the child, mail a ransom letter by using the typewriter that they had stolen, and direct the father to throw a packet with the money in it from the train that traveled south of Chicago along the elevated rocks west of Lake Michigan. They would be waiting below for the packet to fall, and then they would make their escape. The time had come for them to execute their plan on May 21st, 1924. Leopold had rented a car under the false name Morton D. Ballard, and the two had driven around slowly along the south side of Chicago looking for a victim to pick up. They were driving around their home neighborhood, Kenwood, for about two hours until 5 p.m. when the two were about to give up when they were driving north along Ellis Avenue until Loeb saw his 14-year-old second cousin, Bobby Frank, walking south on the other side of the road. Can I just say it's not 
a great idea to kidnap a child, but not only kidnap a child, but to kidnap a child from your neighborhood where people will see you. These two are supposed to be smart, but this is the dumbest idea they probably could have had. He knew his father was also a wealthy businessman and would pay the hefty ransom to get his son back if he was taken. They had pulled the car right up along Bobby and offered him a ride, to which Bobby had refused, being that he was almost home and could walk the rest of the way. Loeb had then said to Bobby, Come on in the car. I want to talk to you about the tennis racket you had yesterday. I want to get one for my brother. This enticed Bobby to get in the front seat of the car as he was excited to discuss tennis since he frequently played with his friends in the neighborhood. He looked at Leopold and Loeb asked him if he knew Leopold, to which Bobby said he didn't. The boys had then started driving around and Loeb asked Bobby if he minded if they drove him around the block and Bobby smiled and said certainly not. The car had driven off past Ellis Avenue and 49th Street. It was at this point, as he was sitting in the back seat, that Loeb felt around for his weapon of a chisel with tape wrapped around the blade as to be used for a club. At 50th Street, Leopold turned left and as it turned, Bobby went from looking at Loeb to looking at the front of the car and this is when Loeb struck putting his left hand over Bobby's mouth and he started beating him in the back of the head with the club. But Bobby kept fighting back and not going unconscious as Loeb and Leopold had hoped for. Bobby turned around, facing Loeb, and had begun being beaten in the forehead instead. This drew blood and the blood had flown across their clothes and across the seats and floor of the car. Loeb had then pulled Bobby to the back seat and jammed a rag deep into the back of his throat and taped his mouth shut. It was at this point that Bobby had gone limp and fell to the floorboards. Leopold and Loeb had driven the car 25 miles south of Chicago towards Wolf Lake, Indiana, to dispose of the body in a culvert. As they were busy disposing of Bobby's body, Leopold's glasses would unknowingly fall to the ground from his pocket and be left there. In order to further obscure his body, they had poured hydrochloric acid on his face. By the time they had gone back to the city, Bobby was already reported as missing. The boys had then put the ransom note in a post box, knowing that it would be delivered the following morning to the Frank family. Leopold had then called Bobby's mom under the name George Johnson and said that Bobby had been kidnapped and to expect a ransom note in the mail the following day and to follow instructions. In the meantime, the boys had burned their bloodstained clothes and cleaned the rental car and got rid of the typewriter and spent the evening playing cards as if they had done nothing wrong. After the ransom note was delivered the following day, Leopold called again with further instructions, but those were soon forgotten as Bobby's body had already been discovered and police had been contacted. The Frank family had been called in to identify the body, where he was positively ID'd as their son, Bobby. While police were at the site, they had found the pair of glasses and were able to locate where they had been purchased from, as they had a special patented spring for the expensive horned rim frame, which was sold in only one place in Chicago and purchased by three people, Leopold being one of them, making police call him in for questioning. He said he may have been there for bird watching the previous weekend and he must have dropped them then. Both were then summoned for questioning on May 29th and asked where they were. Their story is that they were in Leopold's car with two women who they had dropped off at the golf course, but they didn't have names for these women. Leopold's chauffeur and the chauffeur's wife had come forward and said that the car was actually in their garage for repairs, so it was impossible for them to have taken that car that night. This blew a huge hole in their alibi. It was then that the boys started confessing without remorse for what they had done. Loeb was the first to come out and say what they had done, and he had told police that Leopold was the one who was in the back seat and beat Bobby in the head. Leopold then came out and said that Loeb was the one to actually hit Bobby. The boys were starting to turn against each other, and they couldn't get their stories right in that aspect. However, a witness named Carl Ulvig came forward and said he saw Loeb driving the car. So it's not really sure what the truth is here. I know I said earlier that Loeb was in the back seat, but... It's hard to say who was where. Both boys had said that they were driven by the thrill of murder and wanted to know what it would feel like and that they were driven by the ideology of them being like Superman and above the law. Leopold was quoted as saying to the press, quote, A thirst for knowledge is highly commendable, no matter what extreme pain or injury may inflict upon others, end quote. Like, come on. They had also shown police the typewriter that was used to write the ransom note to the Frank family.
The state's attorney, Robert Crow, had a field day with these confessions and had boasted to the press that it would be the most complete case ever presented to a grand or petite jury and that they would surely hang. Crow was big on the death penalty, and Illinois was a capital punishment state, especially when it came to kidnapping and murder. And Crow was the leading Republican representative in the local party and was going to be running for Chicago's next mayor position. He thought that if he managed to send these boys to their death, that he would win favor with the voters and fully planned on using this case to help boost his campaign. The boys' families had hired Clarence Darrow as their defense attorney, and he was a very formidable opponent to Crow, as Darrow was strictly against the death penalty and was dead set on getting him to serve prison time instead of being sent to their deaths. He was also going to use the case in his favor as an example to the public to persuade them that the death penalty had no place in the modern judicial system. He fully believed that criminals suffered from some type of medical issue and or mental issue, causing them to commit these crimes and they should be treated as opposed to punished. There was an issue with how they could proceed with the court as he could not claim them as not guilty as they had already confessed, and he could not claim them not guilty by reason of insanity since they were examined and deemed sane by the courts. The opening day for the trial was July 21st, 1924, where Judge John Caverly indicated the attorneys to each present their motions. So there was a few ways that Darrow wanted to present their motions, the first being asking if they could be seen as insane in order to negate the need for a trial, as the boys would be sent to an asylum instead of the death penalty or prison. However, again, they were already seen as sane, so that one was out the window. He could also ask that the boys be tried separately, However, Darrow had already expressed his belief that the killing was a consequence of the boys influencing each other. Darrow had also thought about trying to have the case moved, being that the death could have actually happened in Indiana instead of Illinois, and was not in the jurisdiction of Cook County. But they would still be charged with kidnapping, so he did not go that route either. And at this point, he was just going to attempt to claim mental illness for both of the boys. So, as a motion, he had told Caverly that the boys were both guilty, but to consider their age, their guilty plea, and their mental condition. By pleading guilty, this had meant that they had avoided a trial by jury, which Darrow was sure would end in the death penalty. This meant that the punishment could range from the death penalty to a minimum of 14 years in prison. During July and August, the psychiatrists that were called to action presented their evidence to the court. William Allenson White, who was the president of the American Psychiatric Association, told the court that both boys had experienced trauma at a young age from both of their governesses. He claimed that Loeb had grown up in a strictly disciplinarian home, and in order to escape punishment, he was forced to lie to his governess, leading to his life of criminality. Leopold, on the other hand, had been sexually assaulted by his governess at a young age. William Healy, author of The Individual Delinquent, and Bernard Gluick, who was a professor of psychiatry at the New York Postgraduate School and Hospital, both confirmed that both boys possessed a vivid fantasy life and were detached from a sense of reality. For instance, Loeb fantasized of being a criminal mastermind and required an audience for which Leopold was very happy to be a part of. And Leopold was someone who needed to follow someone, so the two lived in a fantasy together, fueling off of each other. Crow had also recruited psychiatrists. Hugh Patrick, the president of the American Neurological Association, William Crone and Harold Singer, authors of Insanity and the Law, a t treatise on forensic psychiatry, and Archibald Church, a professor of mental diseases and medical jurisprudence at Northwestern University. All four of them had testified that the boys did not have any signs of mental disease or derangement. Even though both parties were contradicting each other, both parties were also correct in their own ways. So each side practiced different aspects of psychiatry, where Darrow's side focused on trauma and external factors, whereas Crow's side looked for any malfunction of the brain and body which would cause psychiatric issues. Being that there was such dissonance, the judge could not use either side's research of the boys for his final judgment. So at 9.30 a.m. on September 10th, the judge prepared to sentence the boys. They were each sentenced to 99 years for the kidnapping and also life in prison for the murder. In 1936, in Statesville Prison, James Day, a prisoner for grand larceny, stabbed and killed 30-year-old Loeb. Leopold, however, served 33 years before being granted parole in 1958. In order to avoid the media, he moved to Puerto Rico to live in obscurity. 
He began studying for a degree in social work at the University of Puerto Rico, where he wrote a monograph of the birds of the island, and in 1961, he married a woman named Trudy Garcia de Cueveda. And that is the story of Leopold and Loeb. So what did you guys think of that story? It was crazy, right? You have two boys who could have had everything in their future and just turned to a life of crime, and just because they want a recognition for their for their behaviors so comment so comment below what you thought of this case make sure to like and subscribe to my channel and that way you can get more episodes like this at least once a week and be sure to check out our other videos and be sure to check out our podcast so our podcast is Lexi and I and there's more discussion on these cases there's more banter not a lot of banter we don't like to banter during our true crime cases we feel as though it's unnecessary and inappropriate to talk about everything under the sun while discussing a victim of crime. But you should check out our cryptid episodes, our urban legend episodes, our conspiracies. Those are fun. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, Deezer, really anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find us. So be sure to check us out. Bye!